like associate drinking with sex or relationships with yeah. that intensity, yeah. right? Yeah, that, that is zero to 100 and it feels good and we want it. Yeah. But with every good, there's a bad, right? And so I definitely have experienced throughout my life relationships and sexual encounters being drunk or buzz or whatever. But this last relationship I was in prior to moving to Atlanta, I mean, that got ugly. That got ugly quick. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of To The Last Drop. I'm your host, Shelly Robbins. And I'm Domine Spinelli. And today we are talking about sex, so, and the orientation behind it. So Domine, how do you feel about that, huh? Oh my, well it's been a minute since I got some, so I'm <laughs> all the way with it. It would be nice to reminisce on the love we had, like Mary J said. All right, let's bring it back. So what was your first time like oh god you yeah let's get yeah, intimate yeah. let's get to know each other Nikki Minaj said you gotta get the thing wet first you can't just hop in it like that dj hey, to the last drop to baby the- <laughs> right splash <laughs> oh lord <laughs> okay so uh my first time was in high school it was at the end of my high school year so i was like i was literally like 12 days from being 18 and I had my little boyfriend thing, and he was great. He was great to this day, God bless him. And it was in my car. Yeah, yeah. the 97 Honda Civic, Desdemona, the coupe. Car sex. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was a tourist like you, Shelly. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, you already know. But oddly enough, I took that thing. I ain't even gonna lie to you. I kind of, I made the first move. I did all that. Yeah? Yeah, it was me. Were you sober? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There you go. Absolutely. But I wasn't thinking straight, though. I was sober, but I wasn't healed. Yeah. So I was just doing stuff. Like, he was a really nice guy and everything. He would have, like, really went above and beyond for it because it was his first time, too. And that was my thing. I was like, nah, like, the first experience I have with somebody, when they take mine, I want to take theirs, too. So, so being it was the first time that you engaged in sex with somebody in high school, you're a teenager, what made you feel so comfortable for, like, going after him? like making that first move and not waiting for someone to come to you. Not that it's right or wrong, Mm -hmm. but like that boldness to be able to approach a guy. I think it was a traumatic response, uh, to be honest. That feeling of like, (sighs) kind of like, oh, this is what you're supposed to be doing. It's very much similar to the pressure I feel now, being the age that I am and not having any kids. The pressure of like, oh, this is what you're supposed to be doing right now. And then you go off and squander it, you know? And thank God I had the situation because now at this age, kids and all that that pressure it doesn't even i push it off because i'm not gonna mess up what i deserve and having the experience be what i deserve because people are telling me that's what you're supposed to be doing my first time should have been way better than that me as me it should have been better than that but i rushed it and pushed it because that's what we are supposed to do and i I ruined it for both of us really so were you learning like that stance from society yeah very much so what do you think was missing, like, maybe at home? My dad. Yeah. <laughs> it's the truth. Like, yeah. that that fatherly love in the beginning, in the beginning. Like, I had a stepdad and everything, and he's great. He's great. But it's that beginning part. Yeah. My dad. Oh, I get it. You know? I that feeling. So. Because I look at it like, you know, I think it's a it's a known fact the majority of every human being on earth is probably going to have sex before the age of 18 so adolescent years a minor in high school and i think at that time you know we're we're going through puberty we're having our hormones and what we believe to be real and true at that time is so real and true like we don't want to be told oh that's just puppy love oh you don't know what real love is and all that thing because at 15 or 16 or 17 that's the highest level of love you've had from someone outside of the house you live in and you're enjoying it and you're trying to understand it and you're feeling all these things and but I don't I don't believe that there is like true intimacy Mm-mm. in high school like no. you, to really understand the depth of what intimacy is and we are doing w- you know what our bodies are naturally calling us to do but mm-hmm. really what society is setting us to do and it happens more often when you know there's missing parents in the home especially a father for mm-hmm. a girl and then also if there's just no guidance period and and society is telling us you know not being monitored of what we're watching and listening to so we're just falling in line with that yeah it's, yeah. it's absolutely real. And back to the intimacy, like, 
I feel as though had I not taken the lead, and this goes back to what we talked about in the past, being in control and being the head and all of that. Mm -hmm. It's like, had I not tried to control it, I'm sure that I would have experienced some type of intimacy rather than just performing an act because that's what sex was a lot of times a performance and just like in stand-up comedy in order to perform later on this is later on in time i was getting drunk so now sex looks just like my comedy did you know it started off innocent and like oh you know i just want to i just want to try it and then it turns into okay well if i'm going to do this i have to perform i have to put on a show so do you think that expectation was placed on you to perform sexually, even if maybe you didn't want to? Mm, no, I'm, I'm a performer. I like to put on a show. Yeah. Aries Gang, Mariah Carey, Diana Ross, Aretha Franklin, we put on shows. Elton John, <laughs> absolutely. I'm a showgirl all yeah. day. It's yeah. just who I am. Yeah, I would have to say my, my first experience, I mean, complete bipolar opposite of anything. Um, it, I don't even know how to unpack it really. You know, my, my very first sexual engagement was not consent. Mm. And, at, you know, at a very young age and by a family member. And, um, you know, I was 12 or 13 years old. And so when that took place, I don't really know if I understood what was happening. I know I was afraid. I know I did not feel comfortable. Something was wrong. You know, mm -hmm. something wasn't right, but I was afraid because this was also someone I trusted. This was an adult family member, you know, and it just, it, it was just off. And I didn't even know who to go to. And then um, when it came out within the family, it was like crickets. It was like that family secret you brush under the rug and no one ever asked me, like, are you okay, really? Like, and I'm not saying even, like, physically, are you okay? Like, where are the bruises or anything like that? It was inside, right? Mm -hmm. So being that that kind of took on, you know, sexual assault in some form or degree with that one individual for four, five months or so, mm -hmm. um, and it was exposed, actually, initially, through like a letter I wrote a friend in school and the teacher took the note and she was good to like read the notes in class. And I remember sitting there like ready to cry, like freaking out. And I was like, no, please don't, don't, you know? And she read it quietly and she was like, oh my God, come here, you know? And all this school staff got involved, but my family had no real true response. I didn't know, I don't think at that time I understood like this is wrong you know, or is it right? Or is that what, was I supposed to see that or have that or anything like that? You know, even being exposed to pornography, things like that. It was just so normalized, all these toxic behaviors. Yes. And when, I, I wanna say it was maybe a year or two, I, I, I lost my virginity, how I look at it on my own at the eight, in ninth grade. I was 14, 15 years old. I made that decision mm -hmm. to have sex with somebody. And for what reason? I don't, I, I don't even know. I, I really don't know. I mean, it's not that we didn't have like, you know, that little flirting and, and all of that. But again, we were 14, 15 years old and I'm doing, for one, something that's already been done to me. And two, I'm doing something that, you know, is pretty normalized. And at this point, you know, I've been exposed to some family members maybe walking in on them or seeing things maybe I shouldn't have. And again, no response from any adults in my life. And um, so my background with, with sex, it, it ties in really deep to my value of myself. Um, I think I wrapped my value around it a lot and not just, you know, I'm only valuable for sex, but I didn't know anything different because that was the attention I was getting, Yeah, you know, was sexual attention, which I didn't know how to correlate that that was like something negative. It was just, oh, that's the, that was love to yeah. me. You know, my parents were doing their own thing. I didn't have parents really guiding me, watching me, paying attention to me. And if things happened, no one corrected it. And so being 14, 15 years old and wanting that love or, or a father or guidance or anything, I think I, I sought older men um, and I allowed things that I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to be allowed because I'm a kid, yeah. but things took place. And unfortunately it moved into even 
more stuff that I really want to get into at this time. But yeah, it just moved into more abuse and things in that nature. So sex and intimacy are two very, very different things. And I learned um, being drunk or having a little buzz, being a little tipsy definitely takes the edge off of mm -hmm. what that internal voice in me of, of what it felt like initially. And then also, hey, you know what, I'm drunk or I'm a little, a little tipsy, a little buzzed. I like this guy, whatever. I can be in more control, right? It's that liquid courage. It's also, hey, you know what? Someone took that from me once. I'm gonna take yeah. it back. Now it's my turn. Like yeah. now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna step into this role type of deal. In actuality, yeah. that wasn't even me. It's yeah. not me, you know? Yeah. It was just a defense mechanism. Wow, I felt that very much so. Yeah. <sighs> um, when you said that that's where you found your value, and it, they're different angles, but very much I felt the same way, you know, like because I didn't have a dad and there weren't, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because I didn't have that sort of relationship with the stepdad that I had, it was like, okay, well, the girls on TV, like that's how they get attention, by being sexy, by being hypersexual. So I emulated that. And, and then I had, the, what? I'm me. So of course there's a little bit of that already there, but I gassed it up to make it bigger. So by the time I really started having all these escapades, it was like, oh, well, I'm going to, what, what do they say? Men sleep with who they can, women sleep with who they want. Oh, I took full advantage of that because anybody I wanted, I got that. Like, and I stood on it like, this is what I'm about to do. He's on my hit list. What? I got the last brother on my hit list minus Nick Cannon. And this is just before he had all them kids. But the last brother on my hit list, I got him last year. And now my hit list is like done and I everything changed after that like and my I, whole life yeah and i think I, I mean i know a lot of women most women whether they've had trauma or not because our value as women is placed on our beauty our aesthetics first and foremost yeah like we walk into a room that's what we are walking in with right mm -hmm. our beauty hey we look good yeah and we think because a man is giving us attention that we're valuable yeah that, that we're worthy of relationships or marriage, yes. that we're worthy to have children with somebody just because he may want to have sex with us mm -hmm. or he finds us sexy. Mm -hmm. But we just roll like a, like a, a snowball into that and mm -hmm. we're seeking that attention, which I don't think a, some of it is a little healthy in some degree, but not mm -hmm. the attention to the sense of it's boosting our egos, thinking that that is everything. And at the end of the day, like, a man is doing that with everybody yes. because like you said, yes. he's going to have sex with who he can. Yes. So he's got to dish it out to anybody to see who he, who wants to have sex with him, yes. who wants to have sex with him. So he's doing all of that. But every girl walking by that same guy really thinks like, oh, he just, I'm that girl. Yeah. Oh, babe. Like you just got some booty and you may not even have that. Like yeah. you just got some he wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then once it's over, you lose the dude. And it's like, how many times do you have to do that before you realize, like, hey, uh, that's enough. This this angle does not work. That's literally the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Oh, this guy's different. This guy's different. No, he not. No, and he that, not. And that's the deal. Like, what's going on right now, I, I feel like, is uh, the empowerment women think they're getting think. and pressing just to be hypersexual yes. um, on a public level. Like, yes. there's no shame. Yes. And I don't I don't think it's nothing wrong for a woman to like embrace her sexuality and express her sexuality. We're human beings. Right. But we do it on such a level that, you know, there's no shame in the sense of being a hoe anymore. Yes. Like that's actually what's accepted. Yes. Right. That's it's what encouraged. that's what young girls like my kids age are looking up to. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's encouraged so you don't get hurt. It's even encouraged and get some money while you at it. Cause he's gonna hurt you anyway so get some money while you're at it right and it's just setting you up for failure yes because our prime is not the same prime as men our prime is when we're younger yes. right we have a biological clock ticking all these yes. things men don't and so it's like we want to go out there and live our best lives and hey we're going to take control of the situation and have sex with who we want to look sexy look fly say what we want have fly slick mouth all these things yes and then we're 30 35 and this is general not to me necessarily or you, but we're 30, 35 years old. I, I ain't 35, nowhere near that, but 
Just I'm putting that in nowhere near it, y'all. I'm still okay. very young. We ain't got to repeat it because yeah. I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, what is like we get to this certain age where we're like, oh, wait, you know, when I haven't had no kids, I ain't been married yet. All these things. And we have all this baggage, yeah. all these men been ran up and through you, yeah. all these things. But you want to be seek, sought by a man and looked at as valuable to be his wife, to be the yes. mother of his children. Yes. And it all stemmed from the core of let me get this validation through sex. Let me be this sexual creature and being to the world and be dominant in that and own it. Instead of a man taking it, I'm going to give it. Yeah. And the there's no discretion, there's no shame, no. and you're not leaving nothing to the imagination, mm -hmm. you know? And it's just kind of all out there to the point, I know men that are like, it's not even sexy anymore. Mm -hmm. Like a girl with a fat ass, like it's not, every girl walking by has it out. Like there's nothing to leave something to the imagination yes. at all. Yes. And I think that's a super, super big issue right now. I agree. To that, I just want to end it by saying, um, you said there's no shame. And that's real. There's no shame in the moment. Even when I was living my life, like, oh, well, I got hit. I hit that. I hit that. All these people that you wanted, I hit that. And it's like, oh, I, you know, I'm big boss for that. Until years later and you're like, yo, wait, but he hit that too. Like, it went both ways. Like a hug. You give one, you get one. So he got one too. Now you could be like, oh, I hit Dom. Like, I hit Dominé. Like, no, damn, you right. I hit that too. So, like, the shame comes later. Often and oftentimes it comes when you're doing the healing work. Like a lot of times it'll just kick up dust on me, and I'm like, "Ooh, mm -hmm. remember when you did that thing with old boy? You really liked him, huh? He and he dogged you, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Like that's where the shame comes later. I'm talking four or five years later, it comes back around. Hey guys, this episode is brought to you by Jacala. We are the number one luxury brand that empowers you to be yourself and look fly doing it with the flyest hoodies and sweatshirts. So go over to jacalo9.com or join us on social media at jacalo underscore nine to pick up your flyest hoodies and sweatshirts and rock the model with us. We'll be waiting for you over there. I wasn't out there like, oh, I just want to have sex, right? It was, I wanted love. Yeah. Same. I I, d I don't know what love is. Same. I didn't know what love was, especially yeah. from a man. Like, my biological father yes. died. My stepdad, when he divorced my mom, our relationship kind of split, even though I only knew him as my dad, right? So there's no male figure showing me love or anything like that. I'm seeking something natu naturally, subconsciously. And I know every engagement I've ever had with any man that was consensual, it was seeking even if I knew it was in the moment mm -hmm. even if I was drinking or whatever and mm -hmm. I knew it may have been just a one-night stand yeah I'm gonna put it in my mind in this moment I'm being loved it was almost like a, a recharge someone's mm -hmm. holding me or someone's touching me someone's being intimate with me you know and I was seeking that so much but I didn't understand that then mm -hmm. you know I really didn't until more recently and with you know just even being intimate sober mm -hmm. understanding do you know how many times I have cried <laughs> like it is ridiculous like it, yeah like it, because it just it, it's not even just the act of sex and I don't think even someone who's fully healed or is going to sit there and cry through sex or anything like that and I'm not saying I'm boohooing or anything but it it hit me differently because I'm not numb and I actually feel something for you. Yeah. You do something for me more than just this. And then we're expressing it physically. Yeah. And like, there's just this eye contact, there is sensuality, there's intimate, all these things. And I'm like, whoa, I don't even know what this is. Yeah. Oh, this is what this is for? This is yeah. what we do this for? Oh, okay. Yes. And that made it sacred to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to give my body nobody else. Like, yeah. Nobody, you know, like, where, where, what is the value you're bringing me, you know, in that degree? Like, where is it that we're meeting in the middle? Like, if I'm holding myself to this level, you know, as a caliber of woman, then where, who am I going to let answer my body? That That's has true. completely shifted. I know when it comes to alcohol, drinking, relationships, sex, like it definitely plays such a huge part, right? There could be the fun and exciting, you know, that that intense rush, like, ooh, I want you ripping clothes off and you having sex. And yeah, rightfully so, it could be good, real good, right? But then, and people I think associate drinking with sex or relationships with yes. that intensity, yes. right? That, that is zero to 100 and it feels good and we want it. Yes. 
But with every good, there's a bad, right? And so I definitely have experienced throughout my life relationships and sexual encounters, being drunk or buzz or whatever. But this last relationship I was in prior to moving to Atlanta, I mean, that got ugly. That got ugly quick. Like I, I met him under the influence. Um, we drank all the time. This is when I truly started drinking, like day drinking, like those little shot bottles that mm -hmm. I used to get those little SoCo. <laughs> they were a dollar for the double shot. Quick, we we throwing them back. We having a good time, right? Especially in the beginning. Oh shit, this is my partner right here. Like we having a, it's crunk. We're partying, we're gigging it, all this stuff. Until we weren't anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So unfortunately that individual my ex was extremely abusive and i didn't know that until it got deep we moved out of state together to colorado and when we got there and i and i i believe when it separated myself from the majority of my family or or that environment we were used to was kind of when it kicked in and we're now in this place where we're drinking every day it's just part of our daily routine smoking weed every day part of our daily routine i started allowing a lot of things to take place in my life and there was a lot of mental abuse and there was the same, it was always, you were too drunk to remember, that's not what happened. A lot of gaslighting. Yeah. And yeah, rightfully so, I could be, I could have been drunk or maybe I wasn't, but because I drank every day, he knew he could use that to gaslight me. So it was like, oh girl, you're tripping. That didn't happen, oh, it wasn't that bad. Girl, you were drunk, you, you was knocked out. What are you talking about? I'm like, what, you know, and then, now I'm thinking I'm crazy, you know, and then physical abuse. And now I'm drinking to numb the physical pain, the mental pain, the emotional pain, and asking myself how I even got here. And even though I knew, like, I can't be here, I was so afraid to have, like, at this point, I'm 30, 31, divorced with three kids in my second relationship in my life. And deep down inside, I knew it, was, it wasn't going to work. But I was so afraid of that shame being brought on because when a man is single, he's a bachelor. When a woman is single, we don't get that same level of, you know, round of applause. Like, look at you girls, single and out of, no, like an old woman or something, you know. And so I stuck around and it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And that's what, like, even pushed me to rehab. Like, so many different times where the – there were so many physical altercations that took place under the influence. Um, me jumping in the car, drunk, and him, you know, bricks getting thrown through windows, me being pulled out of cars, my, my throat got cut. Like, it, it was severe, very, very severe. And I think my body was in so much shock for the, um, my reality, you know, because, yeah, my life ain't been all that great, and there was a lot of things I got to get over. But this as an adult, when I thought I did healing at some point already, and, yeah. and I felt like now I'm like, no, God definitely pulled another layer back to show me mm -hmm. really what was going on. But for at that moment, it was like, how did I get here? Yeah. And I knew there was going to take so much work. And I felt like I was just stuck. Drinking was my only solution, right? Mm -hmm. And then even days I didn't want to drink, he didn't care. Hey, he's going to drink. He's going to do what he wants. And now that mm -hmm. is infecting me and my children and mm -hmm. things like that. So it was this spiral of effects. And the last few weeks of me being in a relationship with him, um, you know, like he was very slick on how he how the abuse took place where it was never on my face or anything. Like I could cover it up. And to the world, he was this great guy, like very funny and charismatic. You wouldn't think he was abusive unless you probably really knew him. But those last few times, oh, he was socking it out. He, he didn't care anymore at this point, right? And um, so I didn't care anymore. And I got to the point where I was like, yo, if my life is going to be taken, then I'm going to take it before you take it, you know? So now I'm drinking myself into an oblivion. Mm -hmm. Now I'm being reckless. Mm -hmm. And it's like war. And this is all under the influence because sober Shelly I just want to go curl up and, you know, be loved. Yeah. I don't want no part of this. Yeah. Right? So that last time that that took place, this is where I got this innate, like, I got to get out of Vegas. I got to go. And what got me to Atlanta, and that's also what pushed me to rehab, because even though I had got to Atlanta leaving that situation, um, that was, like, uh, the after effects. 
right? I still was drinking. I picked up all these habits, moved myself from that environment, but I picked up all these habits that continued on even into the next person I met, Mm -hmm. you know? But that person wasn't like the last person. And it made me reflect on myself, like, damn, now I'm the, now I'm the problem in the situation. You know, I'm not the victim. And, and that, it, it just spiraled from there. But that relationship right there, I mean, I probably drank every day for three years. When you said the whole, I, I would, um, you're not going to take my life, I'm going to take my life. And that made me feel a lot like how I approached sex in general of like you're not nobody's gonna take anything from me i'm gonna take it from you you know and they're two totally different things but the aspect of like us trying to take control really just put us down a rabbit hole where we had no control once you get to the bottom of that hole or what you think is the bottom you have no control anymore absolutely yeah and you lose control and ultimately i mean that i think it's the escape we're looking for. We, we don't want the pressure, yet we want to control everything, yet we want to let go and not feel like we have any control so we have something to blame it on. Yes. Uh, we don't want to stay in the present moment. We want to fit, like all these things, right? But at the end, even if it takes a little bit more time, maybe it's not right there in that specific experience, mm-hmm. but it is a, it's going to affect you later on, yes. especially if it's happening frequently. And I don't think we, we don't look past today, you know, and yes, be in the present moment, but pay attention to what's going on, you know. Yes. I, we, we know right from wrong. Yes. We know what is affecting us, but it's, e- it's easy to be in that victim state, right? And I, I mean, that's why I stayed for so long, because it was easier to hide behind social media, mm-hmm. to hide behind my closed doors, post what society is expecting, you yes. know, and, and then that's it. And everyone thinks everything is great, but really I'm getting my ass beat over here. Yes, that's real. The saddest time in my life is when I made the happiest videos, especially like Snapchat fam, the people who follow me for years, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. The saddest time of my life and it was like every day I had a new good morning world and everything just looked so great. And in reality, like I was losing my mind, like had considered, you know, giving up and everything else. Yeah. And it is absolutely crazy that we believe it's OK. Like it's it like. It's just okay to be like that. Like what made us get to this point? And so it was like, for me, like 20 years of trauma in and out, 20 years of drinking, I'm 35 years old. And it's like, when does it end? And at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm the common denominator in all my good and all my bad. It comes down to me. And it's like, it comes down to choices, you know, like, yes, this man over here could be very much so the reason I'm physically beat up or I was sexually assaulted or, um, or maybe financially in a, in a stance or whatever Mm -hmm. have you. But I chose to deal with that person. I made a conscious decision to keep that person around. And I, and a lot of people don't get that deep. They Mm -hmm. just stay right there. Well, this person is doing X, Y, and Z Mm -hmm. to me. And they get, everyone to hold their hand and hug them and oh it's gonna be okay and all this as if they didn't ask for that yes. but you attract who you are and so after that situation and when I got here like over these last two years on Friday will be two years since I left Vegas and drove to drove out here mm-hmm. and so it's like these past two years it's just been an amazing journey in the sense of understanding and getting to know myself like why do I do the things I do why do I find myself in these situations because Again, I'm the common denominator. Yes, yes. Uh, Another thing that you said that resonated with me was when you spoke about him gaslighting you and like, oh, girl, you was drunk and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. One of the beauties that I find in sobriety is that even with family, nobody can tell me what happened. I'm fully cognizant of what I said, what I did, how I felt in that moment, and I can recall it for you in a heartbeat. All those years of running away from my problems, I was having interactions that I wouldn't remember the next day. So when I was in my domestic situation for that little fling, I wasn't even with the dude, and he couldn't keep his hands to himself. It was like, 
I had seen that aspect happen before that. I had gotten my forewarnings, you know, that, oh, girl, that didn't happen. There was times he would do it just to just to F with me, mm-hmm. you know, which is how I should have known there was something with him the whole time. Like, oh, girl, you didn't see that train coming? Like, but there ain't no damn train coming. What are you talking about? You know? Yeah. It was little. They insert little things and just so that they feel like they have control of your brain and then they do what they want with your body. And that's whack. Yeah. So not being sober puts you it gets you there faster almost because you're already in a cloud. Literally, you can a pink ignore cloud. all the red flags. Mm-hmm. You can ignore everything you know consciously. Mm, that's probably not right. And if I seen someone else doing that, I'd probably tell my homegirl, my sister, or my mother, whoever. You sure you want to deal with that, right? Yeah. But for ourselves, for whatever reason, we create an excuse just to appease whatever it is that we're trying to fill that void with. And usually it's men. Women use men to fill that void in some level or another because we want that love. We want that attention. And so we'll discard everything else about him. He could be a piece of shit. He could be nothing. Literally. But And a lot of women are with men who aren't nothing in society. There is a big high level of that. And then saying, you know, men ain't shit or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But it's like, yo, that's the man you're choosing. Yeah. Right? And so it's like, at the end of the day, there's plenty of good men in this world. There's more good men than bad men. It's just you're choosing that because you're you're out here operating in a broken place. Yes. And drunk. Yes. Yeah, I know, like, in these past eight months of being sober and having someone in my life where I can engage with them on a day-to-day basis, just do the everyday things or go out and enjoy ourselves or have those intimate conversations or intimate moments and things like that, being sober and having that in my life, that's the first time I've ever experienced this. Um, and and not just on my end, but having someone in my life who don't have toxic behavior such as my own. They can have the control over their drinking. You know, I won't even say it's a habit. Like, I stopped drinking. They don't drink around me, you know, in that degree anyways. And there's certain factors of that that play a huge part. Also, you know, um, being able to see me on the end before I got sober and seeing me now, there's a lot of grace and mercy. I think we as individuals, as women who are drinking and trying to get sober or we did get sober and healing that um, having a man in your life that gives you grace as you're healing is something that is more valuable than anything because you're learning it's like a a baby learning how to walk and talk right they say you learn the most in the first two years of life well if you've been watering down your brain with alcohol your entire life and now you remove this alcohol it's like you're learning how to truly function in society and relationships things like that and then to have someone your your partner your that to be intimate with you and understand you and go through this whole process with you like that is so valuable to me and it makes me not want to be the reason it stops so i want to make sure that you know i am paying attention to myself and i extend that same grace and mercy and realize you know no one is perfect but i also know the things i'm get working through um And then also on top of that, it's like there's more fun, I think. Um, I definitely have had more fun in the last eight months probably (laughs) than I have ever. Like I've enjoyed my life. I've been able to travel, create a business, you know, have a friend in my life that in my part, all of these things, like it wouldn't have happened if I didn't make that choice to better my life. So I'm really excited to have that and be able to experience it for the first time and that, you know, God shedded that grace to even extend that person to come into my life when he yeah. did and it wasn't too late. Yeah. And same, I've, I've definitely had the most fun in the last eight months that yeah. I've had in my whole life. That's true. Even the grocery store is lit these days yeah. and not like from an alcohol consumption aspect. Yeah. And, and what about like dating and, and relationships for you? Like what I know you're not in a relationship with anybody, but what do you aspire to have? Like, how do you see it Okay. now that you're not drinking? Well, I have a great um, radar for good guys. Like I can I can spot them. I've had really positive relationships. The, the problem was I I was the monster. You know, and and drinking didn't help, but it was deeper than that. And that's why I chose Mount Sinai 
because there's a mental aspect, there's a history aspect that um, drinking is just a, a symptom. Thanks. <laughs> drinking is just a symptom of something deeper. So uh, after rehab, I was in a relationship that was very genuine with a great guy. And um, I just still couldn't heal whatever it is. I couldn't get it. I just couldn't grasp it. So like now, I'm just focused on myself. I'm focused on really building myself and my brand and whatever's supposed to happen is supposed to happen. If, if, if he's supposed to come back around and God tells him to, like, that's fine too. If not, my husband is on his way, but I got to get right now. Right. And with me getting older and everything, like, I want to get my career going. I am not worried about this. I've seen places in the world I never expected to go to for the low, low on other people's blessing, like, and now that I'm in a financial place that I can, I just want to keep doing that, you know, these days I spend more time alone, like I said, I love being with me, oh my gosh, I'm my biggest fan, I love being with me, so I need to just keep enjoying that part of me, because once I do, once I am gifted with my husband, I would like to be a family and make a family, so I'll never be with me again, so I am enjoying this part of being with me right now. As you should, as you should, and I, you know, I, over the last year or two, I heard this um, saying that be, do, have, right, and it was implemented in, in like career-wise, professional, but it, it's really in anything you want. Most people want to have this thing in life, whether it's relationships, the job, the family, whatever, right? You want to have that. So you figure out what you need to do to have that. Yes. But you didn't become the person to be able to do the thing to have what you want. Yes. And that part right there is like what people miss. They miss that step. Yeah. And I think it's like where you're where we're at, you know, where you're at is that that becoming and learning yourself and and figuring out who you are so you can be yourself and be yes. okay with that and walk in your truth and be confident in in who you are so the world's not telling you who you are. Yes. And then that way, you know, you're walking with that energy and and attracting naturally your tribe of people, opportunities, experiences, and eventually your spouse. Yes, and that's what I'm being patient for right now. As I as I said before with the whole, I think it was the last episode with um, drinking, God told me, he said, and I'll never forget it because I heard it, he said, if you want to be who we know you are, you got to get sober. And I did that. I came through on my end of the deal. And now he's coming through on his. And I'm I'm starting to look more like who I always knew I was. My vision boards, I have a vision board from like 2000 and, uh, 2016, 17, that things are coming off of it. And it's like, oh my God, that's you did that. Your body looks like that now. Like you have that, you own that, you've been there. And I'm taking it off and I'm like, whoa, like imagine. What can happen if I just stay obedient to what we decided we were going to do that day with my head in a toilet bowl? Like, whoa. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'll drink to that, Domine. I know. That's right, (laughs) Shelly. It's good, ain't it? It is. So what are we sipping on? What? This is that sparkling blackberry Izzy. These are my gym. Yeah. It's um no added sugar, no preservatives, not a lot of calories, real light on the tongue. They make it in this blackberry flavor as well as a, a grapefruit flavor, and I love it. It just does it for me. And you get that bottle effect again. If you like to drink your beer, you can supplement it out with this. You still have the same hand-to-mouth feeling of like, oh, yeah. And you are your buzz. You are the buzz that you're seeking, so... And you know, drink to that too. One, two, hey. Cheers again to the last drop. <laughs> pinky out. You know, you know. Fun fact of the day. Um, pinky out. It doesn't make you fancy. Actually, I actually have to stop doing that in the future. Um, <laughs> pinky out. It comes from. It comes from. Um, I think England. Royal people used to drink with their pinkies out. Why? Because they had syphilis and their pinky got stuck. So the joint is stuck. So, yeah, fun fact of the day. Don't get syphilis.
<laughs> well then. <laughs> well then. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> so, so what's your last drop? <laughs> Syphilis is the last Don't drop. Don't drink and have sex. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> Use protection. Oh, my God.